All right. Well, good evening. Let me invite you once again to turn in your copy of God's Word. And uh, this evening, our scripture passage is familiar. It is Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. In the Pew Bible, that is found on page 73. It's going to be a short reading, but I'd encourage you all, even at home, to keep your Bibles open. I'm going to be making references to other parts of Exodus uh, for the sermon. But just for the time being, we want to read the first two verses of Exodus chapter 20. And of course, this is the first giving of the law. Israel has been delivered out of Egypt, and now they're camped around Mount Sinai. And God now comes down to speak to them. And so, God's word, Exodus 20, verses 1 and 2. And God spoke all these words... I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. There is a reading of God's word, and then also I'd invite you to turn in the back of your Psalter hymnals to the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And that, uh, for those with a hymnal, is found on page 970. Page 970, and for those, of course, at home, uh, this will be printed in your handout. We have a number of questions and answers to deal with, just by way of context as you're turning to it. Uh, The Westminster Shorter Catechism is divided into two groups. First of all, what we are to believe concerning God, and the second, what duty God requires out of man. And we are now just turning into the second. We've completed all of the statements on who God is, who Christ is, what he has done to deliver his people. And now the catechism turns the corner and now begins to answer the question, what is the duty that God expects out of us? And so this is kind of the introduction to that. It's the introduction primarily to the Ten Commandments and the law. And uh, so we're going to be looking at question and answers 39 through 44. And we'll read those at this time. Question and answer 39. What is the duty which God requireth of man? Answer. The duty which God requireth of man is obedience to his revealed will. Question 40. What did God at first reveal to man for the rule of his obedience? Answer. The rule which God at first revealed to man for his obedience was the moral law. Question 41, wherein is the moral law summarily summarily comprehended? Answer, the moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. Question 42, what is the sum of the Ten Commandments? Answer, the sum of the Ten Commandments is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength, and with all our mind, and our neighbor as ourselves. Question 43, what is the preface to the Ten Commandments? The preface to the Ten Commandments is in these words, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And then finally, question 44, what doth the preface to the Ten Commandments teach us? Answer, the preface to the Ten Commandments teacheth us that because God is the Lord and our God and Redeemer, Therefore, we are bound to keep all his commandments. And that is our confession this evening. Well, let us unite our hearts together now in a moment of prayer, asking God's blessing now on the exposition of his word. Let's pray. Our great God and our heavenly Father, indeed, you are the holy God of heaven and earth, and you are the God who is gracious to your people. Father, tonight, as we as your people gather to sit under your word once again, we pray that you would be present among us. We ask for your grace and your mercy to be poured out. We ask that your Holy Spirit would open up our hearts and our eyes. And Father, as we come now to hear what you require out of us, we ask, Lord, that you would teach us, most of all, your grace to us. And Father, teach us also the purpose of your law in our life. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen. Well, when I was in college a number of years ago, I had a professor, uh, 
who was distinct in my mind because he repeated the importance of reading the prefaces to all of the assigned readings he would give us. Uh, he started out right from the first day in class throughout the whole semester that every time we were assigned a new reading, he would go on to tell us the importance of reading the preface of that assigned reading. He, in fact, actually gave us written quizzes to make sure that we would read the preface. Uh, the reason the, pre the professor required this was to, first of all, show us the importance of the preface to guide us in what the author's purpose was. If you've read a preface before, kind of the purpose of the preface is to prepare you uh, for the content of the book. It goes into the author's background, why the author felt it necessary to write the book. Uh, a preface, I think, also is important because it gives a breakdown of the book. At least the professor thought it was important. He thought it, you would more easily digest the content of the book if you had a breakdown of the book before you even began to read the content of the book. Well, by way of example, I think that is also the purpose this evening of the preface of the law. Just like a preface in a book you would read, God gives you a preface before he gets in even the first commandment. God gives you two verses, verses 1 and 2, to prepare you for what you're about to read throughout the rest of the Ten Commandments. The preface gives you the purpose and the reason for the law. Uh, this evening, as we study it, it's important to realize from the outset that the preface begins with grace. The first two verses in the Ten Commandments is filled with nothing more than God's statement of love for his people, and it's a statement of what he has done to deliver his people. God is essentially saying that what follows in the law follows because of his love for us. What follows in the law follows because of his work of redemption that he already has achieved for us. This evening as we come to this, we also need to understand that the preface shows us the binding relationship that we have with God. All of this by way of introduction before you even get to the, any command, God wants, to under, wants us to understand the relationship that we have with him. And of course, we're going to see this morning that that teaches us the purpose. The purpose of the law can never begin or can never achieve God's love because the preface already tells us that God's love is given before the law even is stated. So, uh, context here. We come now to the center point of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. We've seen all that Christ has done for us, all that God has done to deliver us, and now he begins, like the law, to tell us how to live. It's an important reminder that in the Christian life, God's love, his statement of work on our behalf comes first, and then the requirement to respond to that. Here's my theme for us. God's law is given to a redeemed people to show their response of gratitude. God's law is given to a redeemed people to show their response of gratitude. Now I want to look at three aspects of the preface this evening. Uh, first of all, we want to note the relationship in the preface. What is the relationship that God reminds us of? Secondly, the redemption in the preface, what God says he's already done for his people and why that's important. And then thirdly and finally, the revelation in the preface. What does the preface tell you the revelation is in the law? And we'll take those each in turn. So first of all, then, the relationship in the preface. Look again at your text, at these familiar words, and notice the relationship here. Verse 1, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God. Those are words of a relationship. God says, before you get to the Ten Commandments, I want to remind you of something. I love you. God says, before you get to any command, I want you to realize we are in a relationship together. And first of all, notice this relationship is a covenant promise. It is a covenant promise. Where do I get that? Well, notice God begins by using his covenant name, the Lord. In other words, that's the, the word Yahweh. It's the word or the name that was given to Moses at the burning bush. It reminded that when Moses came to the burning bush, it was a bush that burned, but it was never consumed. And then God gives this name because he's reminding Israel that this name teaches that he is a self-existent eternal God who has come to them. 
In fact, I would invite you just to turn to that so we're reminded of this. If you have your Bibles open, turn to Exodus 3, where God gives the meaning and the background of this name. Exodus 3. And uh, let's begin reading at verse 13 here for the context. So verse 13 of Exodus 3, Moses said to God, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, What is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, And here's the name again, The Lord the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name by which I am to be remembered from generation to generation. Now notice, as God comes to the law, Israel would have been reminded of this. When Moses came back to them, he says, Yahweh, the great I am, has sent me to you. And so God begins his law with a reminder of his covenant obligation to this people. Just as Moses was reminded back at the burning bush, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God to Abraham and to his descendants. God has promised to Abraham that I will be the God of your children and your grandchildren and their children. God has a covenant promise with his people to the generation to generation. And so what's the point? Why does God begin with this in the law? God is reminding Israel that he stands by his promise, his covenant, to their forefathers. In other words, in the beginning of the law, this way, he's promising that he will never leave them or forsake them. Even through all of the years of slavery that they were in Egypt, God is reminding them, I have not forgotten you. You were my covenant people. I stand by my promise. One other aspect about the relationship I want to highlight is also it's a covenant belonging, or maybe this way, it's a covenant ownership. Look again at your text. God says, I am the Lord. Notice this, your God. I belong to you. There's a relationship, there's an ownership, this intimacy in this covenant relationship. God is reminding them that they belong to him and he belongs to them. It is a binding relationship with a claim of exclusive love. In other words, as God begins the reading of the law, God is saying, listen, I am bound to you. I am your God. I am an exclusive love for you and you alone. And we are reminded that Israel was called to respond in the law as their response to this covenant love. If you have your Bibles open again, let me invite you to uh, look at Exodus 19. So the context just before chapter 20 is God comes down. Now, notice what God tells Moses to tell Israel about this covenant relationship. Chapter 19, verse 3. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. Again, do you notice the theme here? God says, I'm in a relationship with you. You are mine. God says, I own all nations of the earth. They're mine, but I have chosen you. You are my treasured people. We are in a covenant relationship, and I'm calling for you to respond to my covenant love to them. What is the point to highlight all this? I think the point is this. The covenant God is in is an exclusive covenant of love. He claims them as his own prize people. And now in the law, God is calling for them to respond as an exclusive claim to him alone. And I think here's the main point that I'm trying to drive home this evening. God's law flows out of this binding relationship. I think the best analogy that, that really gets at what we're seeing here is marriage. 
in marriage, a man and a woman stand before witnesses. They stand before their family. They stand before God, and they covenant with one another, and they covenant with God. A husband and a wife make vows to God for an exclusive relationship between him and his wife, or between a wife and her husband, and they vow before God, this person is exclusive to me. But also in a marriage, we are reminded that the husband and the wife vow covenantly with one another. That's exactly what's going on in the Ten Commandments. God is saying, I am your husband. I'm entering into this covenant relationship. I'm marrying you. And now I'm asking for you to respond with vows of faithfulness to me. I have overshadowed you with my singular devotion and love. Out of all of the other nations, it is you that I want as my bride. And he's asking Israel to respond as a bride of exclusive love and devotion to him as her groom. Now this is important to understand because later when you get to the prophets and Israel begins to break this law, it's important because many of the prophets will go back to Israel and they will accuse them of adultery. And if you don't have this context in mind, you're confused. Why are the prophets speaking God's word, claiming adultery to Israel. And this is the reason. Exodus 20 is a marriage ceremony. God is entering into this relationship, and when Israel begins to break this, they are being unfaithful to the groom. And that is why, throughout the Bible, one of the greatest imagery for idolatry is adultery. To seek another God, to seek another one in place of God or alongside of God, is the same as adultery in a marriage. God's law is like marriage vows, binding us in a relationship. Now, secondly, I want you also to notice the redemption in the, pre the preface. So, we have the relationship. Secondly, notice the redemption. Look at verse 2. Verse 2, I am the Lord your God. Now, here's the redemption. Who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery? Isn't it interesting? God says we have a relationship, but also I want you to take note that I've done something for you already. I've already acted on your behalf. I've redeemed you. We learn here in verse 2 that God has already delivered, he's already redeemed Israel from slavery. God is reminding Israel that the basis of the law is that they were already redeemed, they were already delivered. In other words, this generation knew very well what God is saying here. They were they grew up under the harsh taskmasters of the Egyptians. They grew up under the genocidal rage of Pharaoh, seeking to drown the boys in the Nile. They knew very well the harsh treatment that God had delivered them from. They bore up their lifelong living under the oppression of the Egyptians. And God is saying, I delivered you from that. I took you from there. I think as well, in their mind, they would also have been reminded that God did this with an outstretched arm of his power and his might. God says, I took you out of Egypt. Well, be reminded, how did God take Israel out of Egypt? God wielded his creator might through the ten plagues, destroying all of the Egyptians and their gods. God showed his might to the Egyptians in the plagues, and probably to cap it all off, he destroyed Pharaoh and his army, you remember, in the Red Sea. God had wielded all of this might, all of this power, for the sake of his people. And I think here's the point. God is saying to Israel at this moment, as they sit at the base of the mountain looking up, God says, do you not, for, do you not remember what I've done for you? I have wielded all the powers of my creation, and I have brought you out. And even as they sit around the base of the mountain, don't forget... God is sovereignly, Christ is sovereignly providing for them food and water. Now, third thing about the redemption I want to highlight is it's by grace alone. When God says, I redeemed you out of Egypt, I brought you out, be reminded that it was grace alone that God is showing them. Israel was helpless. Israel could not deliver themselves. They were trapped in this. And it was God who acted first. It was God who sovereignly came to them. And, and I think here's the point, as we see or we heard in the Westminster Shorter Catechism, what is the basis of the law? The basis of the law is that God acts first on our behalf. 
And because of that, we owe him our obedience. God is telling the Israelites that they owe their entire existence to his free grace. And the law is their response to that, to him. Now, third thing to point out about the preface this evening is notice as well that it's a revelation. It's a revelation. Uh, very beginning, it starts with these words, and God spoke all these words. In other words, the law begins by telling us the obvious truth, that God is revealing something to us. He's speaking something. He's revealing something. So the question is, what is God revealing in the Ten Commandments? Well, first of all, God is revealing His character. The whole point of the Ten Commandments is a summary of who God is. When each of the Ten Commandments, you get a glimpse of what God is like, what His character is like, and here's what God is like in the Ten Commandments. He is a holy God. The whole point of the law is showing us how holy God is. If you really think about it, the whole Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, builds on this theme that our God is a God of blazing glory. He is a holy God whom we worship. Now let me show you this from the surrounding context. It's interesting that the Ten Commandments are bookend with displays of God's holiness. For the sake of time, we don't want to read it, but if you just gaze or just kind of look at it yourself in chapter 19, verses 20 through 23, before the law, God begins by telling Moses to go down and to warn the people. And in those verses, uh, 20 through 23 of chapter 19, God says to Israel, don't come any closer. You're not allowed to approach the mountain. Why? God says, because I'll kill you. I'm a holy God. I dwell up on this mountain. I've come down. I've come close, but not too close. I'm a holy God. And it's also bookend at the end with chapter 20, after God gives the reading of the law. You notice in verses 18 through 21, it's capped with this description that the people saw thunder and lightning, they heard the trumpet, the mountain was on smoke, and we're told that they feared greatly. In other words, God is saying, I am a God to be feared. I am a holy God. Do not forget that. And so here's the point. God is revealing his holy character in the giving of the law. But that leads to the second thing that God is revealing. God also means in this, he reveals to us, his will for mankind. We don't just see God's character here, but we also see his will for us. Obviously, each of the commandments are commands for his people in how they are to act. Commandments 1 through 4 are God's will for our duty to him, how we are to respond in worship and praise of him. Commandments 5 through 10 are his will for us in our response to our neighbor. But here's the point, and Israel would have got this. When you read the law, God is saying, I'm a holy God. Be holy as I am holy. In fact, throughout the Bible, you get that command. God says, I'm a holy God. You're my people. Therefore, you are to respond with a lifestyle of holiness because I am a holy God. The Ten Commandments reveal God is obligating his people to a life of holiness. But that thirdly then leads to a, a third revelation it also clearly reveals our need for grace. If all of those things are true, that God is a holy God, and if it's true that God calls for us to respond with holy living, the third thing is true in this, and that is God is calling us to receive his grace. If you think about it, God's revelation of his holiness is terrible news to sinners. It's one of the reasons Adam was kicked out of the garden. God says, you're a sinner. And I am a holy God. You cannot dwell in my presence. God's holiness to sinners is bad news. And yet before, we, or in the preface rather of the law, God begins purposely with grace. God says what you're about to read is going to condemn you. What you're about to read shows you you cannot stand up to my standard, standard of grace. But God begins in the preface with a reminder. I'm a gracious God and I will provide you grace. In other words, let me say it this way. God begins the way he does to show that the purpose of the law is not to save us from sin. Right? Paul will tell us that in the book of Romans. The law can only condemn you now. 
God begins the way he does to show us that we first must be saved by his grace before we can fulfill the law. And he would ask the question, well, how would Israel have been reminded of their need for grace at this time? They would have been reminded of their need for grace through the sacrifices they were doing. God had called for them every year to slit the throat of a lamb, to put its blood on their mantle. All of this was a picture that in order for them to be delivered, someone needed to die. And here's the whole point of the law throughout the whole Bible. The whole point of the law is Jesus Christ. When you read the law, your mind should go immediately to Calvary. When you read the law, your thoughts should not go to your obedience first and foremost. When you read the law, your thoughts should go for your need of a sacrificial lamb on your place. When you read the law, the first place we must go is that God had provided a spotless lamb who would die on your behalf for your law breaking. And not only that, you should be reminded that Jesus numerous times through his earthly ministry said that he came not to diminish the law or to abolish the law. He came to do what? He came to fulfill it. And so when you read the law, you should be reminded first and foremost that Jesus in thought, word, and deed perfectly, personally obeyed every aspect of the law. In other words, the law drives us to see our need for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so here's the main point this evening. God begins with pure grace to show us that the law is not to save us, but it's to direct us to seek grace in Christ. And if you think about it, the law begins by humbling us, and that's by itself is grace. When we forget this, when we become proud, when we forget how sinful we are, it is an absolute means of grace for God's law to get you on your knees. And not only that, God's law also then guides us as a way of gratitude. Israel was redeemed and called to love God. And that is still, of course, the function of the law in our life. God calls for us to respond to what Christ has done through obedience to the law. And I guess I would just say this, based on one of the commentaries I read this week, said, make no mistake about it, the law is meant to be strived for, but strived for out of love. We do not strive for obedience to the law to gain God's love. We strive for obedience to the law because we love God. The, love, the law humbles us, and the law also is a guide for us. So, in conclusion then, as we close, what does this mean for you and me? Two things that I want to leave you with. First of all, I think what, why we need to study the law is because it teaches us the wrong use of the law. Uh, throughout history... There are always one of two ways that you can misuse the law. The first, of course, is what was going on in Jesus' day, and that was legalism. One of the wrong ways to use the law is to think that you can gain righteousness by obeying the law. That's what legalism literally is, trying to earn righteousness through obedience to the law. But if you rightly understand the preface, God from the outset says you cannot obey the law to gain my love. I've already given it to you. Um, In the latest children's edition of the Pilgrim's Progress, if you read the book as well, it's in there, but uh, in the latest edition of uh, Pilgrim's Progress for kids, there's this beautiful scene or threatening scene uh, where a Christian stands before Moses in the law, and John Bunyan does a wonderful way of showing this. He has Moses on top of the mountain, and Christian is supposed to climb the mountain of law, of legality, to try to get the burden off his back. And the more he tries, the more he falls flat. The more Christian strives by his own obedience to climb, to get rid of, the more he is pushed to the bottom. And Bunyan wonderfully shows us that is the foolishness of legalism. That is the foolishness of what the Pharisees were doing. Any type or any lie to say that you can obey God's law to gain his love will simply crush you. The law crushes believers because we cannot achieve it. But the second wrong way to use the law is to not use it at all. At all. And I think this is probably the greatest error today. This is technically called antinomianism or no law. This is a view that Christians don't need to live by the law because we're of grace. We hear this a lot today, that, that the Christians, our New Testament Christians, we, we don't need to hear the law. That's an Old Testament, and that's an error. The law clearly is important to the life of the Christian. God gives the law as an outworking of his grace 
in his relationship to his beloved bride. And so as I thought on that this week, how can I give an illustration that would show the, the reason for the law in the life of the believer? Well, think of this analogy. Imagine a husband telling his wife that he will not keep his vows of fidelity to her, but he will continue to love her. Imagine a husband, after being married to his wife, says, listen, I love you and I'm going to still show my love for you, but I'm not going to keep my vows of fidelity. Would that wife have any reason to believe that that relationship is healthy and in store? No, you would say that relationship is broken. There's something drastically flawed. That is the same thing a Christian speaking to Christ, saying, listen, I, I love you, I'm in a relationship with you, but I'm not going to keep the laws of fidelity between the both of us. You see, the law functions like marriage vows to us in Christ. We display our love and our gratitude to him through conforming ourselves to the life of the law. And then secondly, I just want to leave with this. It also teaches us that by grace... We can please and obey God. This teaches us that by grace, Christian, you and I can actually please God. I don't know if I've thought of that enough in my own life, but but we do see in Scripture God saying that our striving after this, our seeking to conform our life to the law, when we say no to sin, believer, you please God. We saw that a couple weeks ago, didn't we, in the, the sermon on sanctification. We are called to make steps of holiness. And what we learn from this is that pleases God. When you strive to obey God's law because of love, that's not legalism. That's you seeking to glorify God. Jesus himself said this in John 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will what? You will keep my commandments. And so here's the main point. Motivation for obedience for the believer flows from love. Love for God is the reason why we strive to obey the law. And it is that law which shows us his love for us. So may we be Christians following the law out of obedience because of the love that has been given to us. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, we thank you for your law. Father, we thank you that you did not leave us to our own standard, but that you have given us your perfect revealed will, your moral law to humble us. Father, tonight as we begin our study of that, we pray that you would give us that humbling grace to bring us to the end of ourself. Father, we pray that as we think on these things, that you would show us the mercy that you have given to us in Christ. And Father, we pray also that by your grace and your spirit dwelling in us, that you would raise us up to be people who out of love and thankfulness, seek to live in conformity to your revealed will because of your massive love to us. Oh, Father, we pray, work among us as your people. And we ask this in Christ's name alone. Amen.